Hi, and welcome to episode 63 of Talking with Painters, where Australian painters talk about their lives and art. I'm Maria Stolger, and this is part two of a two-part special on the Tony Tuxen exhibition currently on at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. In episode 62, I spoke with the curator of the show, Denise Mamoki, about Tuxen's life and work. Tuxen died in 1973 at 52 years of age. He worked at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, rising through the ranks to become the deputy director, but all the while was painting at home. His first of only two solo exhibitions came three years before his death, and he's now considered one of Australia's important abstract expressionist artists. So in this episode, I get stuck into a few of the paintings themselves with the wonderful Aida Tomescu. As many of you would know, Aida has an episode of her own on this podcast. Just go to episode 33 to hear a great story of her arrival in Australia from communist Romania and her rise to becoming one of our most respected artists. She's won many awards, including the Wynn Prize, the Sulman Prize and the Dobell Prize and has exhibited in over 30 solo shows. We talk about the paintings, the paint, what the paint's doing, guessing the intention of the artist and ponder on what effect it's having on us. We start in the fourth and last room with the magnificent work, White Lines Vertical Ultramarine. I'd like to talk now about one of the most um, stunning paintings in this in this exhibition it's called white lines vertical on ultramarine it was painted in 1970 and this like a lot of the other paintings in this room it's in the fourth room uh, it's a hardboard work it's two panels there are a lot of these paintings of two panels and they measure about in total about two meters by two and a half meters and it has a ground of ultramarine in varying intensity and um, there's multiple wide lines, which, which actually, it, you know, um, as opposed to the title, they're actually not all vertical. I think you were saying that there's, there's quite a few layers to it. Um, it. It's obvious from looking at the image, even in, in a book form, uh, if you look in the, um, in the lower area of the, of the ultramarine, you can, see the, uh, you can see previous white forms underneath that have been veiled by the ultramarine. Oh, I see. So you mean these areas here? So with the lighter areas of ultramarine, you mean that, that there's probably a white under that? There would, there would have been many layers. So he would have worked with his white forms and the ultramarine and the ground and the masonite ground all together at the same time, changing and reshaping and rechanging and reshaping until they all grew together, mm. uh, and, until everything happened together. You mentioned energy before, that you were attracted to it, Maria, because of its energy. And maybe uh, before I say anything else, one thing to say about this painting and generally about Taxon is that energy uh, is concentration. Uh, that the reason um, you are so attracted by the energy of this painting is not because of the energy, or not only because of the physical energy he invested in it. Mm. Uh, It is more because of the relationships created between the forms he he was working with um, and um, and the, the, the concentration that comes from those connections. Um, so the energy in painting, uh, or in a painting such as this, um, well, it, it's a much more considered painting than we would give it credit for. So uh, in other words, you, right, I see. So what you're saying, it's not as if the energy comes from the swiftness of the application of a line. It's, 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 um, it's a constant... Um, it's a constant, I don't want to use the word balance, I never like using the word balance in painting, uh, but it's a constant move between this uh, sense of urgency uh, and boldness and directness with which Taxon applies his paint, and also the, and very much so, the uh, considered way with which he um, uh, disconnects them, he feathers the edges of them, he reapplies his paint, he uh, rebuilds a form. I also like how the stain of ultramarine, which is really a veil, a stain, uh, it's got such wonderful, rich presence. Um, it looks as if uh, he dissolved it on, on, on the set. Now, I just, something comes to mind. Uh, Mark Rothko, um, 
didn't want to paint a painting, he wanted to breathe paint onto the canvas. So you f I feel that this ultramarine is doing the same thing oh, here. He doesn't just paint it or applies it on the masonite, he breathes ultramarine pigment onto that masonite. It's got breath, it's got, it's got air. We were talking about omissions and we were talking about this bottom left hand corner where there's like a, the, the bottom of that, of that um, line for want of a better word, is, uh, is obscured on the left-hand side with, with like a circular ah, sort of... Uh, I'm going to take you up on the word obscure because you didn't use the word omission, you used the word obscure and that's very important because, because you have a feeling it's still there, yeah? I mean, yes. you already mentioned obscure and that's, that's a very important thing. Um, uh, we see it uh, everywhere in Cezanne where, where part of an object um, is, to use your word, obscured. It's still there. The pre its presence is still fully felt, even though it's not painted. So an element in a painting can stand for more than one thing. Uh, the ultramarine stands for both ground and the white form uh, that's obscured. Mm. Um, so often uh, in a painting such as this, you have an element uh, that performs a stand-in for a number of things. Um, and and um, um, f creating form and volume through absence, it's something that continues on from Cezanne. One of the, the parts that we haven't talked about much and that is, is in a lot of his paintings is the use of the drips. Ah. And you were saying that is, uh, there's a consideration for each of those drips. Well, it, drips would happen because of the... Um, of the, of the physical, you know, drips will happen just through the physicality of the painting. Yeah. And we are constantly reminding, reminded with a painting such as this of the physicality of his approach. Now, what the, the most interesting thing about Taxon to me is that uh, in spite of the physicality of the approach, the sense of urgency and suddenness, there is always, you know, both suddenness and serenity in the work and stillness in the work. And the, and the stillness... Um, and, and uh, serenity in the work uh, comes through his constant thinking, the intelligence, the intelligent logic that develops in the painting. Mm. Now, uh, dri the drips are an essential part of that because he chose to retain them or he chose to veil them. You'll notice that a number of the drips are, uh, so, uh, some of the drips are so fine, they become drawings, they become... Um, like a detailed drawing that, and what do they do? They give us, they perform supporting roles for the white protagonist yeah. that begins to fill up more. So in a way, the detail of the drawing of some of those very fine drips uh, is very intricate, they're very intricate. It's like they, they've splintered, it's splintered from the, the they, larger forms. Ah, it's a very beautiful way of, uh, mm. of putting it. And, and in turn, they make us more aware of the fullness of the white forms too, mm. by contrast. Uh, but also you will notice, because we began with that, uh, how he uh, veils quite a number of drips. And I like the punctuation when you have one, two, three coming. So they create rhythms um, and clusters. They come together, they break apart, they fracture. Uh, they, they softly merge into one, one another, uh, and in the physicality of the process, drips would emerge. However, mm. not all of them are retained. Mm. And, and so the ones that we are looking at that are retained become part of the, of the unity of the work. And they really is another way of drawing with paint. They can become a, a drawing with paint. Um, that that serve to give more volume and mm. form. You know, by so contrast, very, yes. give more volume and form to the bigger form. Let's talk about another painting. It's, it's called Yellow. It's a, it's um, held by the National Gallery of Victoria. And uh, if you're in the gallery, you have to just go back one room. And this painting has retained a lot of the um, ground showing, so the masonite is not painted on. So probably a third of it. And it's a, uh, a very large, massive yellow paint, um, vigorously applied. But what we're focusing on is the very centre. It's two panels, and just where the two panels meet, there's such an interesting uh, collection of drips. And they're colours that do not appear in the rest of the painting, so they're very fine red, blue drips. Um, I'm just absolutely fascinated by the uh, fullness, uh, urgency, uh, I want to say boldness, 
but by the richness of those blue coming through the middle, which were obviously intended there, mm. um, and um, and how they change the temperature of the yellow, this yellow, which is really a very cool yellow. Yes. Um, and um, uh, areas are edited out, uh, uh, drips are edited out, veiled again. Uh, oh, it interests me up the top that the white surrounding, the white form surrounding the yellow, um, the intervals where they stop. So it's a question of rhythm, it's a question of intervals that create a full unified image that we mm. then engage with. Um, now you said that it's quickly applied. If you look at where the underneath it, where the yellow started, just say on top, you would notice how he'll have a, a number of layers leading all the way up to the fullness of the form and then so we're talking which part of the painting are we talking about so we're talking about this the right hand panel there's uh, the the sort of ochre yellow area at the top the cooler yellow mm. um, do you uh, can you see the direction of the brush can you see a number of layers there yeah i wouldn't have thought it'd be many the I would have thought the left-hand side of the painting is much more layered than that area. Yeah, but even then, one of the reasons to concentrate on the very subtle area where, where you don't see as much is because our eye gets sensitised by that and begins to perceive more as you look. Mm -hmm. um, it, That's interesting. Uh, the volume of fullness growing in there, I mean, it's obvious that the left-hand side is so layered and so, you know, going to town with so many, with so much, uh, it's so much fullness. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the very subtle area, uh, you begin to notice more the direction of his brush, how he constructed with his brush, mm -hmm. and also begin to notice more how um, subtly he changes the angle of his brush from a vertical to a slight, you know, the uh, rotating point of view of, mm -hmm. uh, um, that changes all the time. It's interesting uh, that you're talking about an area that that is much more subtle that most people will overlook and I realise that that is quite a, an important part of the painting because without that, the, there's no force to the other more dynamic areas in a way. Well, constantly with, with stacks and you have, um, you have this sense of urgency and suddenness and you have stillness. You also always have serenity, which is, uh, which is uh, unique to him. Mm. Um, completely unique to him. And you now, think that's something he would have been aiming for and striving for? He was aiming uh, for a painting um, that was a full experience that took on from, as he put it, from everything out there. That, and he was a uh, aiming high for an intelligent painting mm. and so the structure that develops in each one of those works carry that intelligence it's not just a matter of executing or pouring all this energy on on, on masonite or on a canvas um, he was working with energies that come through paint uh, it's interesting that uh, we always as people you know we always um, tend to think that um, that particular palette, say dark or, or strong colors uh, like reds, mean something to do with the artist's life or emotions or the stage of their life they're going through. And they have nothing absolutely to do with that. Often a palette gets restrained because uh, the artist or the painter is dealing with new concepts uh, that they are questioning mm -hmm. and then uh, re uh, restraining the palette. So what, allows sort of, what them. sort of concepts do you mean? Well, we're looking at everything out there. <laughs> it's, 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 so you trying know, to capture that it's immensity broadness. in a way. It's broadness. They broad. Mm. They broad. Uh, mm. They just take on everything. Mm. You know, it's like uh, you have a Mahler symphony. And Mahler did say about his symphonies that um, each symphony is like, um, like an entire world. Now, coming into this third room, Aida, I'm, I'm really struck by these drawings on the left-hand side. And, you, and anyone who comes in here, there's um, about six drawings. And the one we're going to talk about is the very first one that you come across. And it's untitled from 1970. It's about 228 centimetres high and um, 76 centimetres wide. So it's a very long piece of paper. Um, and what it is, is you, there's basically a line at the top across the top of the paper 
and then with about a dozen vertical sort of wavy lines of varying lengths running vertically down the page. With a work such as this, do you notice what's happening at the bottom? Yeah, well, the actual paper is ripped. Sort of ripped, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So as he worked, or as he, as, as he uh, took it out of the roll of paper, he ripped it. Mm. Now, what happens with the drawing within it is also a response to the rip. In the, on the, yes. uh, so it's very to where the lines, the charcoal lines end. Uh, that and also it's, it, it, pro it, it became a trigger for some of the, for, oh no, it became a trigger for, not for some, but for the image that began to be born. I mean, I know it's, it's some um, clusters and for, formations of line formations, let's mm. call it. Mm. Um, but the, the size of the paper, the shape of the paper uh, gave a direction. Uh, gave the direction to this work. Oh, and the I fact see. that it's ripped at the bottom is a very important compa component of the work. Nothing is accidental with Staxon. Mm. Uh, nothing is accidental. And if he didn't need it, he would have cut it off. Yeah? He would have yeah. gave, given you a straight line. So you'll notice yeah. that every drip, every. What I um, would. We is always. Uh, there's always a connection between everything. And that's. We touched on that from the first painting, and that will uh, be the refrain towards this show. That is yeah. always a connection. Now, what I'm interested in is. We mentioned the word in, in the second painting we talked about lifting something from the ground. And we talked about building and lifting. Now, we look at a drawing such as this, and can it be built? Is it built? And it is. Mm -hmm. And why is it, be, is it just built? Why would, not, not just, but why would it be built or well, elevated from the ground instead of just uh, a cluster of lines applied on the ground? What makes it constructed? And, and uh, the, the, um, the, I don't want to say clue, but uh, the important factor to consider, a uh, crucial factor to consider is how active the white paper is is the blankness of the paper incorporated in the drawing or is the paper uh, just a support, a ground for this drawing? He takes on the support, but he actually activates it. And again, I go back to Cezanne. Um, Cezanne, in his drawings, often made use of absences. So say uh, you would have a drawing of a um, plaster cast mm. and the, the leg of the cast would be missing. Yet when we looked at the drawings, the drawing, our eye uh, makes for the missing Mm. Uh, missing, so we create, we participate, it. we participate in the forming of that drawing. It's the yeah. same with Staxon. Yeah. We participate in the, in the forming of, of this drawing, and we, and the, the white of the of the paper is imbued with uh, energy. Uh, do you notice a very thin, hardly perceptible uh, kind of straight line going down on the right hand side? Yeah, of I the did drawing? notice that. Yeah. No, so it just shows us how he built them from the ground, how his first, the first attempt was just one very th slight tracing, which echoes the format of the paper. It's nearly parallel mm. to the edge, yeah? Mm. And mm. from then on, he built it, yeah? Oh, so you think that would have it's been... It's a very like, important, yeah. I think it's a very important, it's just he dropped the straight line echoing the, uh, echoing the format, mm. and that allowed him uh, moving into, because really you move into the paper, yeah, yeah. and he moved in, yeah? He, he settled into that piece yeah. of paper with his drawing. It is very important for anybody looking to ask the questions as to why something stops where it does, why the point of pressure is where it is, and what kind of tension it creates. And it constantly is because through that he makes a connection between that line and everything else in the drawing. Mm, mm. So it's a lot more complex mm. than we would give this credit, uh, yeah. this drawing uh, credit for at the first at first glance. Well, they are quite important those points because your eye does sort of stop at the at those points. Uh -huh. It also makes our eye travel across, the, not just up and down, but just across. It mm. creates it creates a horizontal out. out uh, movement for mm. our eye. Mm. So it's nothing will be arbitrary, like with everything else. If there is an incision into the drawing, if there is a stop and start, it will, it will have echoes uh, into other parts of the drawing. It will all be a un there will always be a reason for it, and the reason would be the unity of the work, mm. and in a way, this drawing becomes complete meditation. Let's just, well, let's move along here, and um, there's another painting in this, uh, in this room. It's untitled. Um, it's also known as White Sketch, and it's a, it's a very long piece of hardwood. It's, a, it's just over two metres high and about 90 centimetres wide. 
and it basically consists of a couple of lines. It runs from, it's a white line that runs from the bottom right hand side of the painting all the way to the top. It, it doubles back slightly and travels down to the left and then um, drops down to the, le uh, the left hand side, breaks and continues with another line which is in the same direction. And there's just a few white drips on the right hand side of the painting, bottom half of the painting, and there's actually, a, I think, a couple of red drips in there as well. Very, very, very small. As we said before, with, with Staxon, uh, nothing would be accidental. So, you know, the, the, the touch of red interests me a lot, the way it can colour the white, and the fact that he left it there. He would have edited out at least the one that he could on the, on the white. And we noticed that in the, in the painting opposite to it, in the same room, yes. we noticed the use of other colours and drips of other colours uh, that we don't expect in the middle of a painting that doesn't appear to have that colour, again, red. Uh, so. Uh, Knowing, uh, looking at Taxon and knowing how considered he was, uh, they, would, they, they are not accidental and they locate everything in space as well. Mm. Um, so uh, dripping in ways that make so much sense is an interesting thing in itself. Now, what I want to say is uh, Taxon didn't title his painting, so we are left with white sketch uh, as titled after him, uh, I mean, uh, as a way of recognizing the image, I suppose. Uh, but was he considering a white sketch? Uh, I doubt it. It, it, it doesn't, uh, and they, there is a question here for you or anybody coming in. Does this painting look as if it's missing anything? Do you feel uh, that it's a simplicity? in execution, it's, it's, it's very much a painting that followed the line of economy. Mm. Yeah? Mm. If ever there was a painting mm. that followed the line of economy, this is it. But, right. but is it, is it simplified? Is it, I mean, it takes an economical approach, but does it have depth? Into the, into the, is there depth into the ground of the Masonite, even though he hasn't touched well, that's, it? That's interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's, it's certainly much more powerful than you would have expected when you just think there's one or two lines. Nothing there. seems to be missing in terms of depth mm. uh, or in terms of construction. Now, how does he achieve that by not touching the ground? Again, an amazing, you know, wonderful Cezanne lessons uh, through how he positioned everywhere, everything else in the work, mm. through uh, the white, uh, which is not only uh, which is not only one layer, which will not, if you notice on the right hand side of the corner, for one thing, how the the, the the calligraphy of this white mm. uh, identity does not does, does not um, come out of the surface. He didn't exit with it. He no. keeps it right on the edge. That's right. So it's still lifting. It's still kind of um, it's still ho hovering in a way. Mm. It's also bouncing up. Words. Yeah. yeah? Mm. And he uses the color of the masonite that comes through from underneath, and in a way adds another color or another yes. tone uh, yes. through uh, through the transparency of that mm. white. I read, read recently uh, of Jackson Pollock working on a drip painting, mm -hmm. um, stopping and turning to Lee Krasner and asking, is this a painting? Ah, yes, I and read I, that. Yes. And I think it's very interesting. Yes, that's a similar thing. I wonder if he asked himself that. The question, yeah. uh, possibly, and but everything is here. And I wonder if he did that and then thought, is it enough? You know? uh, Could have, but, but it is enough. Now we've come into this second room of the exhibition and it, you just get totally bowled over because there's about, what, about 10 large paintings and the thing that they all have in common is that they're all black, red and white. Now, um, I understand these paintings were, were painted about between 1961 and 1965. The majority of these works are quite, um, what's the word, what word would you use for them? They're quite active. They're very charged. energetic, they're charged. charged. There are lots of shapes, um, different symbols. And the painting we are looking at at the moment is called Swirl. And we're standing it. So when you come in the room, it's immediately on your right, on, uh, on the wall on your right. It's very intense. It has, the ground is probably like, it's a light gray color. And then on top of that, there are many, many layers. It's very hard to describe, but it's effectively these different shapes in basically predominantly a red color. In here, looking at this, uh, he creates, again, identities on a different scale. Um, they broader identities, they are forms, but they become his characters. Mm. They, become, uh, they become the characters or the protagonist of, the, of this actual painting. And 
first of all, so I, you mean so in other words that, that they take each of those um, forms take on a sort of a personality almost. Yes, they do. They do. It's a, it's a beautiful way of saying it. Yes, each one of the forms, and in a way, each one of the smaller incidents you won't detect, like something like a drip, could become, could form a distinctive identity in the realm of the work, mm. um, which is the reason why uh, the painting uh, is absorbing us, or we can revisit it so many times. So mm. I don't know why with Staxon um, you have such sense of urgency, and perhaps the way to best qualify this painting or this entire room is this sense of urgency in them. They certainly, uh, in the midst of creative energy, in the midst of creative inventiveness, yet there is also stillness and serenity. Mm. Uh, so it is one of, um, I think in that... I can uh, see stillness and serenity in that painting. As you look, you would. Because really? As you, as in you what way? What do you think? How do you think it's still and serene? Really? Because to me, it is so, there's so, the, it's so frenetic. It is frenetic. And if you stop uh, and look at it again, or for a while, uh, you will slow down and begin to travel within the painting. As if you begin to travel within the painting, you come around every form or element in the work, it begins to slow you down. And it begins to slow you down, you don't just have frenzy, you also have... Um, you also have... Uh, they also, yes, they, are, they always have meditative qualities, even the very bold ones. You think so? So, mm -hmm. so this reveals itself through time, you have to spend some I think time it's got, with the um, I think it's always good. It's always better to stay, uh, to spend time with paintings of this measure because because you uh, what you learn from them uh, is incalculable. Um, but yes, it's it's bold. You can you can be attracted to the energy of it. But is that all there is? Is the energy the most important part of it? Well, I suppose that maybe one part of it that that does give more of a meditative quality is that the sense of light that is emanating from it. The oh. construction. Mm. And it's the construction between the relationship. You'll notice that you have the forms, but then you also have um, uh, direction. He drops diagonals or vertical mm. li lines of black that then connect the various elements together. So it is again always a matter of the connections it mm. generates. So this painting, Untitled, uh, from 1973, which is held by the Art Gallery of New South Wales, it's an absolutely exquisite painting and it's a collection of thin washes of yellow and white paint which appears to be formed slowly from repetitive washes which go up, down and across and with some sublimely beautiful charcoal marks on the left, upper left-hand side of the painting. But there's this elongated narrow opening into the ground in the sort of center bottom part of the painting, well, to the left of the center, where the unpainted masonite comes through. And there's a story behind this, in which, which Denise Mamaki re refers to in the Tuxen book. And, and the story goes that a friend visited Tuxen in his studio when he was painting this, Melina Monks, and she, Apparently she didn't realise that this was his sacred area, the studio, and he, she just sort of walked in and, and found him painting. And um, she just said, oh, what's, what's the meaning behind it? And he gestured to the curtains which were blowing in, in the breeze in his studio and said, it's about this. And then he gestured out of the window and from his home and said, and everything out there. So that sort of encapsulates, in a way, it's such a great anecdote um, as to what he's, I suppose, as you were saying before, about what he's aiming, he's aiming to do, and it's, it's like sort of heroic, really, trying to capture everything out there. What do you think about the, the effect of, of that, that opening uh, in the painting, that, that, that narrow opening? Well, uh, everything that follows uh, seems to have come as a response uh, to this opening. The sublimely beautiful charcoal marks uh, that just lift off this ground um, uh, on the left-hand side of the painting that you mentioned echo the opening that happened. Uh, everything is an echo of everything else. Mm. First of all, it seems like a painting with an aura. It's got an aura mm, about it. Does, it. Yeah. Um, and uh, and. What's fascinating to me about the, the, the Masonite opening is the opening of it could have happened or would have happened slowly and 
how much of it he was going to open or not was being um, decided by the work itself and by the progress of everything else in the work. What's interesting to me is how in any other painter's hands this could have been a hole onto a ground. Uh, but but in, mm. in Taxon's hands, just like Cezanne, before him, uh, he can move from open areas of the ground, like this masonite ground, to the fullness of the indeterminate yellow area. He can move all the way to that, and all of the transitions between the opening and the fullness of the form are there within the space of a few centimeters of, of surface. Mm. And how he achieves this, uh, those transitions are very, uh, is... is um, well, it's unknown to us. Uh, it's through repetitive washes of paint. Well, it's sort of, it is a real entrance point into the work, isn't it? It's an entrance point, but do you stop here with the eye? Does your eye travel, you know, in another painter's ha- uh, hand, if this was, it's such a strong entrance to the work, um, you would stop here, but does the eye follow through or travel throughout the work? Mm. It does. Mm. And why does it do that? He echoed that with a very, very subtle, it's a very subtle painting, yes, one of the is. most subtle, and well, in a way... the dripping as well, the dripping that has been veiled over with uh, ah. consecutive washes, that echoes it as well. Exactly, it? exactly. So now we get it, the dripping becomes another way of drawing. Yeah, it, becomes, you know, it echoes the form, the opening, it echoes the uh, charcoal line. So in a way, it's, it's uh, possibly a very wonderful, beautiful... Uh, how would I say it? Uh, it's a miraculously beautiful painting, but it's the right painting to maybe uh, end a show called The Abstract Sublime. Well, Aida, I must say, I'm very pleased we ended with this painting because it's just given me such a great insight, and especially through your eyes. I just have just loved looking at these paintings and hearing your views on them, and I'm just coming away with a totally new appreciation for Tuxen. So thank you so much. Thank you. I wish we could do him more justice, but when it comes to Taxon and looking at the work, again, I'm always lost for words. I mean, you wouldn't think so. But in a way, uh, it's very hard uh, to put in words something, uh, s- s- something of the magnitude of what he could achieve uh, in this work that has the appearance of something so simple. I uh, agree. Yet yet uh, but you know what? You've done such a magnificent job in, in doing that. So Thank, thank you, Maria. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Aida about Tony Tuxen's work. Aida has also contributed an essay to the Tuxen book, which has been edited by Denise Mamoki, and there's a link to that on the website for this episode. For those of you who haven't uh, listened to the podcast before, you can follow the podcast on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. There's also a YouTube channel if you just search Talking With Painters playlist on YouTube. There's over 80 videos there of all the artists that um, I've interviewed. Thanks for listening and hope you can join me for the next episode of Talking With Painters. I mean, we'd always find new things as we look. I mean, we could continue with this painting every day for the next year, and we still <laughs> won't know it. And, and, you know, it comes to life. That's yeah. the, but we can't yeah. really, you know, when we said, we can't really dissect them, because they are alive, and they are mysteriously themselves, and there's so much about them. We'll never be able to understand, and we'll always uh, just... Uh, it will come closer to experiencing mm. a bit more. Mm. But as we do and we learn one thing about it, it will throw open other questions mm. and other, other, um, other experiences.